Welcome everyone to the Keeping Your Business Alive During COVID-19 and Beyond. Uh, this is a webinar series organized by BizHack, Digital Marketing Training Academy for Businesses, as a service to the business community to help give you the information you need to survive and hopefully thrive during this really challenging time. Wanted to invite you to follow us at BizHack Academy to keep up uh, with all of our programming. And if you want to share on social media, you can use the hashtag BizHack. It's great to be here today. Uh, we're really excited by the kind of feedback we're getting from these webinars and we're going to plan to continue them because of that great feedback. Um, we're very appreciative of um, all that you've done to make it feel like this investment is worthwhile and helpful to you. That's really our goal. And uh, we have some great uh, webinars coming up and please share uh, the word uh, about them. We're trying to keep the 1230 Wednesday time slot, which seems to work for a lot of folks uh, as a, a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of information to help you uh, move forward with your business. So, um, Today we're going to be talking about brand love, uh, the essentials to generating lifetime customer loyalty, uh, even during difficult times, or maybe even especially during difficult times. We have Abdul Muhammad, who we're going to uh, I'm going to do a fuller introduction to a, 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 a 20 plus year veteran of some of the top digital and communications agencies in South Florida. Next week, we're gonna do a more hands-on um, technical training around social media video ad tips and tricks. We're doing that with the very talented videographer, Neto Almanza. Neto has also been an instructor at BizHack and has gone through the program. And he's gonna talk about how you can create uh, quickly social media video ads that can help draw new customers to your business and raise awareness of what you're doing. And then in two weeks, uh, I'm very excited to have Shana Ostrovitz. She's the head of 1909, which is an accelerator for startups based in West Palm Beach. And she's going to be talking about building community. This is one of the things that she is specialized in, both uh, at 1909 and in the startup Rooster that she founded, and something that she is better at than almost anyone, which is how to uh, create community, um, encourage and, um, and, and nurture that community and ultimately uh, turn that community into an enhanced revenue and business for you. So that's going to be in two weeks. I hope you guys join. Um, those event rights are up and they'll be in a follow-up email that we send after today's session. So I wanted to do a very quick introduction for those of you who are new to me and to BizHack. My name is Dan Gretsch. I am a journalist turned marketer and educator, and my expertise really is storytelling. I came to digital marketing as a storyteller who didn't know how to get my stories to the right audiences online, and that's really how I have come to digital marketing is as someone who had important things I thought to say, whether as a journalist or as an educator, but needed help figuring out how to get there um, I've spent the last seven years in study on that topic and then started an academy to help other business owners and marketing communications professionals solve for that themselves. We at BizHack are, are very proud to be a top startup uh, in 2019 as named by the Miami Herald and part of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Accelerator Program. If there are any Goldman Sachs folks on the line, please send a shout out on the chat. It's great to have you here. We've partnered with the top universities in South Florida, including FIU, Miami Dade College, and Broward College. And we've also partnered with a number of the top business support groups in town, including the SBDC, the Miami Bayside Foundation, uh, who Michael Selinger of the Miami Bayside Foundation is on the, uh, on the call today. I'm uh, very honored to have you here and, and others. And we've worked with uh, more than 300 businesses across South Florida. One of the things that we really focus on is bottom line results. We really do believe at BizHack that digital marketing really only makes sense if it's driving leads and sales for your business. Now, you have to create a strong brand and engender loyalty in order to do that, 
but it's ultimately the bottom line results, which is how you measure your success, also known as the ROI or return on investment. And we're very proud of having an ROI uh, of 29 to one compared to the ad spend of the, court, the folks who've gone through our program and to have helped bring to our 100 plus businesses who've gone through our intensive program more than half a million dollars in incremental sales. This is really meaningful and those sales just continue to roll in even after the program is over. So today we're gonna to talk about one of the essential elements to being successful in terms of marketing online, which is called brand love. Um, how do you win loyal customers for life? And how do you do it at a time when many of us personally and professionally are really challenged? Our, our speaker today is um, uh, Abdul Mohammed. And one of the things that we really love to do uh, as part of these sessions is learn from each other. And so I wanted to invite you to take a minute now and in the chat, in the group chat, and, and, and hi, Michelle, and hi, Grace, nice to see you, and hi, Gustavo from 10KSB, and Al, uh, an FIU and JMI grad, great to have you guys here. Please take a minute in the chat and see if you can answer this question, which is, how are you trying to build and cement your relationship with your loyal customers. In other words, when you're looking at the folks who've been doing business with you the longest, are you calling them? Are you talking to them? Are you asking how you can help? What are you doing to try to be supportive of them through their tough time and how to get them to keep you top of mind when they think about who they're doing business with? I'd love to incorporate your examples as we have this conversation with Abdul. So if you could take a minute and please uh, put in the chat some of your thoughts about how you're trying to build brand loyalty during uh, COVID-19. And we have a response that I'll read um, from Kate Boyer. So Kate says, we've been doing live Instagram TV sessions showcasing our products and having guest hosts with us answering questions from them, hundreds in an hour. Fab fabulous, Kate. Um, Kate, what, what is the, uh, if you could put this in the chat, what is the topic of the live sessions that you're doing? Um, Ellen Marchman, uh, who uh, works uh, in, in, hi Ellen, nice to have you. Uh, we have, she says availability, empathy, and strategy. So she's working with her clients on that. Al Bove said, we're working hard to send out regular communications, emails, phone calls, et cetera, just to let them know that we're thinking about them, how they're doing, and not even mention the business side of things, and they appreciate. Al, I think that's really one of the pieces of advice that we consistently have been hearing week after week, I think we're now into week six of doing these, is just reaching out and on a human level saying, is there anything I can do to help you? Um, not many businesses are doing this, and those that do, do cement uh, lifetime loyalty, as we talked about. So keep the input coming, guys. I see you, Gustavo and Alexis um, and, uh, and Kumba. Um, we'll continue to bring in your examples throughout the conversation to bring in those best practices. Um, Kate Boyer, by the way, who's doing those Instagram live sessions, uh, the topics include golf edit, body type dressing, a cooking class with a chef wearing our line, soon um, having a travel agent giving updates. Thank you for that, Kate. So please those coming in, uh, have those come in, guys. Or I see them coming in, Nicholas, uh, Vanessa, Ruthann, Jerome. Hi, Hutch, how you doing? Kenneth and Rosemary, thank you guys. But um, I wanna now give uh, Abdul the floor and then we'll begin folding in more of your comments um, as we continue the conversation. So Abdul Mohammed is, um, uh, a dear friend of mine. He's going to be talking today about three content marketing strategies to help you cultivate lifetime customers. And if you look in the chat, there are a handful more strategies that you can leverage. He's going to talk about how to become a brand that is loved and considered over the competition. And he's going to give us tips on how to balance the technology and the human touch to maximize your marketing impact. And one of the things I'd say about Abdul is he is really that rare uh, bird that is able to combine deep technical expertise with powerful communication and branding uh, knowledge. And so you'll hear today him talking about branding, but recognize that behind that 
uh, is a guy who for the last 20 years has been on the cutting edge of digital marketing technologies, starting with web development 20 years ago. He started a firm that got acquired by Zimmerman Advertising, and then he joined Zimmerman to head up their digital department. Zimmerman is uh, one of the top 20 agencies in the country. They specialize in retailers like, you know, Party City or uh, other retailers like that. Um, and Abdul was with them for a number of years before then becoming the chief digital officer of RBB Communications, South Florida's largest communications agency. He's now off on his own, um, leveraging virtual reality and augmented reality to build a uh, new business that's going to really shake up the publishing industry. So Abdul is an extraordinary talent, a, an entrepreneur, and he is also um, a uh, very dedicated volunteer. Um, he has been working for the last three decades, which uh, Abdul, you look like you're 25, so I don't know how that's possible. Uh, but you've been working with the Quality Life Center uh, since before he was born, um, uh, which provides at-risk children with the tools they need to make a difference in the community. And Abdul is now uh, heading up their advisory board and expanding their offerings into Southeast Florida, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Abdul is just an extraordinary, soulful, smart, uh, hustling uh, person and a, a real honor to have you here today. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. It's Thank nice you to see everybody. Jan. Thank you, I appreciate the warm welcome and our friendship over the years. And uh, it really excites me to really be a part of uh, what we have here and what you're doing at BizHack. Uh, I remember back when it first started, and you know we're really talking about concepts and ideas and what you've really done in regards to developing a community that really is committed to supporting PR and communication specialists and everyone else beyond that with effective communication and digital marketing skills that keep them aligned and abreast of what's taking place is just, it's awesome. And it's a great friendship and has cemented into a, a wonderful partnership and looking forward to creating more and more programming together as we uh, develop uh, systems and things that help and support the community. So thank you. Thank you for creating this platform and having me on here. And thank you for all of you who are joining uh, today. I know that there's a lot of things you guys could be doing, especially in this day and age where it seems as though every single day there's a webinar, there's a, a meeting and a Zoom to join, things that are competing uh, for your time that now has sort of shifted, especially structurally. And so I just wanna acknowledge all of you for being here today. And uh, for, for that being, you know, our experience that we can create together. So looking forward to it. And I know that there's a lot going on. Everybody is dealing with different uh, challenges and struggles as we go through the current crisis, the, the situation. And I just want to be present to that and take a moment and pause. Oh, and just take a deep breath and for us to all be grateful that we are here and together. And despite everything that's going on out there, just wanna sort of give a collective, united, deep breath of unity and hope that we will and we will get through this. And on the other side, all of you will be that much better. So that or something better. Um, and I'd like to kind of root us in that energy and in that optimism, in that hope, uh, in that knowing, that deep-rooted knowing, in looking back at history and all of the things that we've been challenged with as people, as human beings, as a nation, and knowing that these things pass. And so thank you all for being present despite what's going on in your world and being here. And my main commitment is really to look at how I can support you all as you looking at, at your business personally, uh, from a brand perspective, and even larger in the impact you're having on the planet and how you can look at ways to communicate effectively during this moment, but more importantly, all the time, despite what's going on in the environment. And so thank you again, Dan, for sharing a bit about my history and where I've been uh, and, and for your kind words in regards to my age. I appreciate that. And thank you all for giving me an opportunity to get out of my PJs because I <laughs> sit around at home. And so I had to, you know, step up and put on a shirt. I uh, appreciate that and that opportunity. 
and really looking at right now focused on everything that I've done in my career and all of the things that I've learned from people like you all and clients and really just listening has put me in a position to provide brand strategy, digital marketing, and focus on growth. And so I'd like to bring that to the table and all of that knowledge and really look at all of those things that have brought me to this point now where I'm focused on providing executive branding, publishing, and business growth solutions. And it's all based on a premise of going in to really understand the human nature that is associated with brands. Going in, letting something out and creating not only for yourself, but creating with the people that you're trying to serve. And this is super important and at the core of how I'm built my business and philosophy. It really is focused on the things that will never change. And so when you think about that, regardless of COVID-19, the real estate depression, the market collapsing, uh, war, uh, social issues, economic issues. There's certain things that will never change about business. And these things are people. There's always going to be people in business involved. There's always going to be a brand that those people reflect. And there will always be technology that will allow us to communicate, to facilitate exchange, transaction of information, and everything else that's associated with business. And so I'd like to start by rooting us in those three principles, those core principles, people, brand, and technology to set the stage for how we're going to communicate effectively how to build your brand so that it is successful and their loyal customers beyond this current situation. And so <clears throat> focusing on the things that will never change, like people, brand, and technology, and this is different depending on everyone's business. And so when I like to speak and, and share, I try to provide a framework knowing that for everyone, there's a unique situation. In marketing, there is no such thing as one size fits all. There's no such thing as just because this works for this brand, it's gonna work for this brand or industry. And because of that, if you position yourself as a brand structure that focuses on people, brand, and technology, regardless of what your business is, that will allow you in itself to core fundamentally position yourself to be sort of um, in the flow, regardless of what's taking place. People will always do business with people. And so by focusing on the people and who you have, how skilled they are and how they interact with the clients and the customers that you wish to grow is super important. How you humanize your brand so that you can create human impressions versus impressions. And I put my air quotes up for people who are in the industry, in advertising and digital marketing in particular, where we talk about impressions, 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 and people come to us to do business from a marketing and an advertising exchange all about impressions. And it's gotten to a place of mistrust. It's gotten to a place of inefficiency. It's gotten to a place of sort of what I would call BS impressions. And so what's more valuable are human impressions human impressions. And so a lot of times, and one of the things that I want to talk about is how technology and sort of the race for growth and scale has allowed some people and some brands to make the mistake of putting the technology first. And that's a big mistake. It's all about connecting emotionally with the people and where they are right now and leveraging technology, positioning your brand and the people within that context so that you're providing the highest level of value, the highest level of value always focusing on the value you can provide regardless of the time. And right now you may have to rethink your business offering for the current times. And so if you root yourself in people brand technology and look about how you can humanize your brand, create those human impressions regardless of what's going on, then it creates a space for creativity, a space for innovation, a space for you to look at, is your business relevant at this current time? And for some of you that may be a yes or no. Either way, it's a place to start. More important than anything, when you're looking at building strategy, brand, content, and really working in the space of marketing, what's most important is to listen for and reliably deliver. Listen and reliably deliver those things that are most important to the audiences and communities you wish to serve. A lot of times we put business and brand and the things that we think are important first. And that in itself is always the wrong approach to any kind of strategy, marketing, and communication. 
especially right now. It's all about asking, listening, serving, leading, and delivering. This is a formula that works extremely well, regardless of the current times, but especially in the current times. And it provides a blueprint and a core fundamental way that you can structure all communication that goes out across all of your channels. The things and the strategies and the approaches and the concepts that I'm speaking to today, regardless of what your communication channel or platform is, it works. And so root everything in right now, and fundamentally it will serve when we get past this, a positioning of having an infrastructure and a process internally, whatever works for your internal system, where you constantly asking, listening, serving, leading, and delivering. And I'll break down how we kind of get into some of that. First, these questions should be of top of mind for everyone. And if they're not, and you're not having those questions in all of your communication, no matter whether you're using a WhatsApp group or you're using a Facebook messenger or you're using snail mail, email, doesn't matter. These questions need to be at the forefront of all of your communication and content strategy. How can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I support you? What can we create together in order to help your life circumstances now? And how do we create valuable experiences? By rooting yourself in this content overarching strategy, right? And we'll get into some specifics that you can customize based on your scenario or your industry or where you are, uh, whether you're an individual, whether you're a brand or whether you're an agency, these things work all across the board. The beautiful thing about it is if everyone operates in this way and shares this philosophy, we all rise. Kind of funny the way COVID in the current situation has really got us connected in a way that we haven't paid attention to before. It really has gotten us connected in a way that we haven't understood before, not only physically, and it's funny the way it's like social distancing has also gotten us very present to our connectedness and interconnectedness as human beings in every aspect of our lives. And so by prioritizing conversations, by prioritizing conversations over clicks in your communication allows you to sort of shift your perspective. It's something similar to when you as an individual decide, and it's a decision to decide, to look at life in your current situation as, I'm gonna go old school now, the glass half empty or the glass half full. And it really is that simple. And those people who take on life and make a decision to fundamentally shift. Nothing changed outside. It's the way that you looked at what's going on that has changed. And I ask that same sort of half, glimp, half empty, half uh, full approach to be filtered into your communication strategy when you look at social media and prioritizing conversations over clicks. This time right now more than ever is really the time to lean into social media's inerrant superpower. I remember back in the day when I was at Zimmerman in 2008 and we're talking about social media strategy and how we go about doing this, working on brands like White Castle and Friendlies and Party City, things like this. And it, nothing has changed. It's still about listening to what's important to the clients and delivering. The thing that has changed is that now we have access in a way that we never had before. You've got data and information and the ability to unpack it like you've never before. So rather than, than kind of the well, yeah, we have to pay attention. It's now what tools do you use and what listening do you apply to glean the knowledge and insights outside of that information such that you can drive effective conversations, story make versus story tell. You know, you hear a lot about the storytelling, but it's more about story making and that drives the storytelling. If you're making stories, then the storytellers rise up. You don't even have to tell the story because you're making it. And so how we're shifting this perspective around everything is really fundamental to how social media is set up in the first place. And it's kind of full circle now, the way this whole crisis has gotten people to really take a look at how we should have been doing social media in the first place. Build community, share entertainment, right? Support each other. That's what the whole system was built for in the first place. You know, Abdul, before you move on from story making and storytelling, uh, Kate Boyer was asking for you to just dig in a little bit more on the distinction. Maybe you could give an example of making a story that then facilitates the telling of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad. Great question. Yeah, thanks, Kate. So, so I'll give a good example. One example is there's a, 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 Portland, a Portland distillery. And I'll kind of share that case study in a little bit more detail, but I really love having active communication and not just going through uh, a PowerPoint. Those of you who know me know I'm not a PowerPoint person. 
So I really appreciate asking questions so we can shake it up uh, in the mix. But one of the case studies that I thought was, was extremely interesting and leveraged sort of the innovative approach and also creating stories is a distillery that, you know, in their own process of creating their, in their brewery, they have the first batch of alcohol that comes out is like 80% alcohol. You can't, and they can't ever use it. It has to continue to go on the process. So prior to that, distilleries throw all of that stuff away. All right, they just throw it away, it's waste. And so because of the current environment and the shortage for all of the hand sanitizers and how people needed this stuff right now, and this is so core and fundamental to what's essential for everyone right now that's dealing with this globally, they saw an opportunity to innovate and create a story around bottling the waste that they had, adding a couple of basic elements to it and giving these branded bottles out for free. And so, of course, that's a huge story. They're now <laughs> contributing to, you know, positive impact and reducing the spread of this horrible virus that's ravaging people. And so immediately, because they decided to do that, right, now they created story. And all of these stories started to pop up. That's how I even heard about it. And it wasn't from their advertising or anything like that. It's because they decided to create a story based on what they had. And again, everybody's situation is unique. So I'd like to give examples, but think about it as having a structure so that you can look at how this structure can be integrated into your current scenario and then leverage those tools accordingly. You know, and I'll give another example from last week's uh, webinar. We had one of the BizHack alumni come on. Uh, they provide, they're called Harbor Linens, um, and they provide um, kind of high-end, um, you know, uh, sheets and towels to luxury brands. It's a Bed Bath Beyond company. And they have a lot of unused inventory that they're now converting into face masks. Face masks that are not medical grade, but that can be used by us normal folks so that the medical grade masks can go to the um, frontline healthcare workers. And they are story making by um, creating what they call the Hospitality Heroes uh, Initiative. They created a logo, they created a landing page, they created a volunteer opportunity, and they're inviting other furloughed and um, underemployed healthcare uh, um, uh, hospitality workers to do something for the community and to give back uh, at a time when they're not able to work. So that's a beautiful example of taking what you do best um, and then making a story that then automatic, automatically attracts media attention and that becomes something for you to story tell about on your social media, in your sales calls and so forth. So rather than trying to kind of manufacture a story, you're making a story that comes from a genuine place and putting it out in the world. Absolutely. And I mean, think of it in the, in the Portland example, they're giving away bottles for free that are branded and they're offering these bottles and you can come refill the bottles. So they're being consistent with things that are important to people, not only now, but then for the environment. And then what are you doing there? And then you're now having someone that has something that's branded that they're using regularly, keeping the brand top of mind. And so there's a lot of opportunity to do that. And so as we look at that framework and sort of setting it up and allowing you, you to sort of lean into the listening of what's available not only based on what you have, what you do as a business, but what your audience, your community is, is interested in and what's most important to them. We get into three content marketing strategies that I think uh, anyone on the call can sort of activate. And if you're already are doing some of these things, you can double down on them and look for ways to make them more efficient or drive higher return for you. Knowledge broker, community leader and innovator are three of the most effective content marketing strategies, not only in the current crisis, but also ongoingly. Some research behind the knowledge broker that really had me sort of focus on this one as, as one strategy that I wanted to share is really looking at the impact and understanding that from a marketing standpoint, all effort and energy should be tied to some sort of return and really looking at 
how you quantify that return for the effort and the content and the engagement and what it is that you're doing out there on social media. And looking at the delivery, delivering customer impact, seeing a 50% higher revenue sales, 34% higher profitability and 63% lower customer attrition. Like these type of things really is what calls this out as a highly effective strategy to invest in, not only now, but forever. Knowledge broker and the data that is associated indicates that people who are really looking at and consuming different educational material, much like the material that you're consuming right now, um, everyone's turning to the internet for that with the shift in the way that we are sort of distanced. Also looking at marketing and sales funnel strategies. So not only putting it out there, but what happens with the knowledge and with the individuals who are consuming your knowledge. How are we funneling and continuing to add value and build on what's there? And that is all in the space of engagement. And then giving an alternative to the other things that people are home doing. Um, whether it's like me getting the munchies and eating and having Netflix binges from things that my friends are sending me, uh, to working on content, but really looking at how do we break through all of that content, the, the hardcore quality content that Netflix is binging on and really tap into some sort of curiosity and personal uh, connection with the people in the time. And that really is key. And when you think about it, that's actually what Netflix is doing. When you look at the diversity of the programming they're putting on, from an empowerment standpoint, really looking at entertainment and really mixing it up. They're a great model for, uh, for any brand when you think about what they've created, the curiosity and the value in that exchange. So that's the, the knowledge broker strategy. Next up is community leader. And everything we do, we root in, in the data, we root in the information and uh, really looking at from a Gallup research standpoint, again, aligned with brands of purpose, they've given twice as much of the wallet share, 47% of customers who aren't aligned with that same brand. Um, so 23% increase in that information. So this is what really brings us into the community leader and why this is so important. When you think about Nike and what they did with Colin Kaepernick and really taking a stand for something, no matter what side you're on, right? And everyone kind of <gasps> gasped when that brand really took a stand. And they forever, in my eyes and many other eyes, will be a community leader. And as far, as, as, far as a brand is concerned, has just set the stage. Case, just, in, just in case there's some non-football fans on the, on the line here, let's just give a little All bit right. of context. So Colin Kaepernick was one of the most talented quarterbacks uh, in the recent generation and made a decision to um, take a knee during the um, uh, national anthem that ended up uh, getting him uh, blackballed, uh, essentially, from pro football. And Nike, to uh, Abdul's point, then made a really, really um, brave, risky decision to sign him on as a chief spokesperson and put on some pretty provocative ads featuring him um, and the stand he was taking. This was really risky because football fans in general, um, well, I don't want to say in general, but there were a lot of people in the football community that were not happy with what Colin Kaepernick was doing and that felt it was very disruptive. Uh, there was a huge racial element to this um, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, quarter, quarterbacks in, is a position where you have about an equal number of black and white quarterbacks, and Colin was a black quarterback. Uh, a lot of football fans are white um, uh, that were upset at him. So it was really, really a, a powder keg of an issue. And then Nike comes out with some very, very edgy ads. Um, and, and this is a mainstream brand with a lot to lose and a lot of people that it could potentially alienate as well as endear in a move like that. I, I noticed that immediately as a marketer and felt it was extremely brave of them to, to go out that way. Thank you, Dan, for adding that context to it. Extremely helpful. I'm gonna jump on and try and share my screen again, get back to it. 
All right. So as a community leader, the impact is 47% share of wallet. And in the example of Nike, if you look at sort of the trend and the trajectory of their stock and what happened, again, direct impact there. And that's for a huge brand. Imagine what someone that has a little bit more affinity and localized community building and the impact that that has. So really looking at how all of you, and I'm sure I know for my business, I'd love to have another 47% uh, share of wallet. Um, if, not, if not that alone is enough to really think about how you can take a stand. And I know as individuals, it takes a lot of courage as an individual to take a stand, let alone as a brand. But the payoff is huge, not only right now, but forever. And if you really look at taking a stand, and especially right now, sending a message of hope, a message of inspiration, when you look at Google Trend data for some of the highest searched content, you've got a couple of things going on. People are in a state of depression. People are anxious. People are in need of hope and inspiration. And so as a brand, if not anything, this is one of the things that you're able to provide, especially when you look at focusing on retaining existing clients um, and looking at the value that that provides. Oftentimes businesses spend the majority of their time focused on new client acquisition. And while that's super important, when you look at the statistics around how you keep a client happy and the customer life value, again, these three strategies is about shifting your perspective and if you changed your perspective and spent more time strengthening the relationship with the existing customers, really honing in on listening and the research to understand the current needs and offering creative solutions, regardless of what the time is, then you would know that you would empower your community by really looking at how we can take lead in whatever is most important to the audiences that you want to serve. And not just as an advocate, it's not enough to just give lip service, but how do you actually root your brand fundamentally in that core principle? Because that is what makes someone and makes the, the emotional connection that lasts beyond the, the crisis and beyond any other and allows your brand to be considered over the Adidas or other brands that are considered in that connection. So as a community leader, how do you look at tapping into your community, especially leveraging social media? And one of the biggest ways is to look for collaborative content. And I know especially for small businesses and people who are building up, it's extremely difficult or one of the most challenging parts of marketing is to really come up with the resources to provide amazing content, right? And so this is a huge opportunity to collaborate. You've got people that are home, whether they're your employees, whether they're other people who are influential in the industry, et cetera. And this is a perfect opportunity to leverage research data of what's most important and then collaborate and really take leadership in creating experiences that are branded and provide value for those audiences. So how do you get in touch? Have them create with you, not for you. A lot of times, you know, old school, we used to have these contests where you incentivize and pay people to do different challenges and to post different things. And again, it's very self-serving brand to do this for me versus this is something that the whole community wants, needs, and is hungry for. How am I as a brand going to lead the co-creation around this fundamental mission or principle that lives beyond a product or service? This is key. When you lead, it lives beyond the product or service. As a leader, once you have the trust of the people, right, the destination may change, right? Because you're we're on this journey of life, whether you're a brand or whether you're an individual. And so on the journey of life, there are many destinations on that road. And once you establish yourself as a leader that people follow and that becomes the brand, then the destination product or service becomes less important. It's the mission, the community that you serve and the experience you create. And how do you leverage the technology? Because remember, at the core, we're building things that are bulletproof in the sense that people, brand, technology, that will never change, right? And so currently, the best technology to use that allows you to collaborate at a large scale where you're in touch with the data insights and information is chats, webinars, live videos, social stories, all of these different tools and, and distribution channels are available to us. 
So how do we add their creativity in ways that provide value for our audience? Again, from the very beginning, we were asking those questions. And so those questions that you ask your, your audiences is what this should all be rooted in, what you should be leading for them, right? Moving on to the next strategy, innovator, and really looking at how you can leverage innovation and innovative thinking to drive revenue and relationship growth. One of the things that was really key about Gallup Research, specifically with B2B customers, is that when you look at their patronage and loyalty, which is uh, what this is all about, right? Building that loyalty. Companies that always deliver on what they promise that feel like the perfect company for them, right? Again, this is very emotional. This is how it is for me, right? And looking at that, being proud to be a customer. I'm proud that that company stands for things that are important to me and my community. This is fundamental. It's because now when you're in a, a situation where most people and most products and services that brands provide, they're not essential. They're just not not in a state of crisis, they're not essential. When people are struggling and don't know when their next paycheck is coming in, it's not essential. And so how do you look at <laughs> becoming a brand in this moment that your customers who you wish to serve are proud of you? You gotta lead. And that innovative thinking when it comes to leadership is an opportunity that beyond the current moment will drive at least 23% revenue and relationship growth. So that being said, we look at how can you innovate, right? And one company that I look at locally that really has done a great job, and, it's, and, I, and I wanna focus on this, this local company. It's a company called Modern Ohm. A good friend of mine, Mike Leekoff, runs it. Um, started it uh, many years ago, and it's really at its core based on community and mindfulness and really bringing a positive vibe and energy to the new lifestyle and to the way that we live. Right? and sort of making it more mainstream to be mindful of the most powerful machine that we walk around with that we don't use to our capacity, our brains, right? And going in and how that provides it. But what he did, and I wanna show it because we talk about these big brands out there, Nike, this, that, and the other, and a lot of times in case studies and when you give strategic insights, it's, it's somewhat difficult if you're not a big brand to really understand how you can integrate that into what you do now. And so I wanna bring up Modern Own because it was a, a company that, is really based on bringing together this, the mindfulness community in Miami and beyond. And at the time focused on venues and having a series of events throughout the year um, and throughout the week at different venues. And it was all about gathering, physical gathering and yoga and mindfulness and different activities and you know, energy healing and things like that. And so when the crisis took place and now we've got a social distance from a business standpoint, you could see how quickly that business was just, it's gone. How do you even maintain business and membership and things like that? But rather than folding, Mike and Modern Ohm innovated. And so one of the ways to innovate when you look at content creation is to really focus on the people, the brand, and the things that are habitual to them, how you create habits. And so a content marketing strategy, when you look at creating appointment viewing habits is a core strategy. And what they did is created what's called cushion crawl. Now this cushion crawl has been going on for years, but it's a physical thing that takes place in Miami usually, where these beautiful uh, venues in different locations all over uh, are selected. And every day at a specific time, there's a physical gathering where people come and sit on their mat to do meditation and gain the conscious uh, learning that's taking place. And it was something that took place for years at specific times during the year. Now this year, because of the COVID-19 coming up, Modern Ohm couldn't do the normal crawl, but instead took the crawl online. And at first, this was something that was, oof, is this going to work? It's very, very different in a yoga class or in a meditation class with people uh, than online on Zoom. It just feels different, right? So there was kind of hesitation around that. But Mike and Modern Ohm doubled down and they created a specific content that came at times that people were able to tune into around their habits. And he really looked at the listening and surveyed and audience the membership to find out what times were best suited in order to provide these uh, daily doses of mindfulness and really created this episodic content 
that now a community every day, I think they're on day 37 or day 40, imagine the impact he's having on brand building on that community ongoingly, every single day, two times a day, specific times, providing people a go-to source to really just purge their depression, anxiety, and open them up to the very thing that's important to them. And by taking that content and publishing that content, the same day, the same time, in the same format, this creates that habit that then has positioned them to be a go-to resource. And when you look at the way that they marketed this in hashtag, hashtag until we can hug again, it, it took what used to be a, a smaller sort of uh, uh, yearly annual campaign called the Cushion Crawl. And now it's been going on for double the time that it's ever gone on. And it's going on for infinity and the value that it provides. So this is a way where that company looked at their, their current space. They innovated. They thought to themselves, how can I tap into educating and leveraging my community tapping into all of the different teachers that have different modalities and different philosophies and providing value for people who are just suffering like everyone else that needs a pause and a, and a moment in this chaos to have a safe space to just dig in. And so this became the, the core principle. And then he went to collaborate with mindful teachers and philosophers like myself, aggregated them and created a platform that ongoingly provides value. When you look at from an education, an educator standpoint, Modern Ohm took that on as a core strategy by educating and doubling down on the community and providing this access for anyone to come and be a part of this. They then offered additional value for those who see that and they became the community leader by leading the leaders who are actually teaching their own communities and uniting into one big community so that everyone rises on this platform. And then by innovating and creating a very specific programming that people can dial into and don't have to be challenged or conflicted with the content that they want to receive at a specific time, thereby reinforcing over and over again the loyalty that's there. And so, I wanted to kind of show how a small brand like Modern Own that was challenged with some of the most difficult situations, event planning, uh, bringing people together and their core monetary uh, driver was destroyed with what's happening here, has been able to look at these three content marketing strategies and leverage them to build a successful brand that people are tapping into and will continue to be effective now and after. And we kind of talked a little bit about the uh, Shine Distillery and Grill um, earlier when I thought it was super innovative to really look at the business, right? And so you hear me from Mind Development Mastery, and that's, that's my company now. And, and what we really look at in Mind Development Mastery is going in, letting out, and creating something. And that's the core principle that this innovative brand took on. They looked at what do we have inside, inside our company that we have going on? For them, it just happened to be, hey, something as, as random as waste of alcohol. And they innovated. Who am I currently serving? What's going on currently? What culture cues am I taking in order to innovate and come up with an effective value proposition that allows me to provide value and impact now and build loyalty ongoingly. I don't even in Portland, but I put them down just from hearing the story. I went to their website. I saw the food and I saw everything in the moment that I can travel back West. I'm going to go check out Shine Distillery and, and enjoy. Um, and, and it's these types of things that, I mean, I'm all the way over here on the other coast. Don't even have their hand sanitizer. And now I've saved it, looked at their website, visited their website, saw them on Instagram. This is how it works. This is how it works. And so this is a, a way that you can innovate. And one of the, because we always like to have some big brand stuff in there, right? Because sometimes people don't believe things unless it comes from a big brand or unless a big brand is doing it. And all big brands do is wait for the little brands and people like us to do it so that they could then go do it. So we, it's fun the way that works. Um, so full circle. So U-Haul, uh, a big brand, 
who happens to be doing something that I thought was pretty cool, which was offer free storage for college students. And that, that's something that right away really speaks to an audience that's smart from a brand perspective, right? Because how long are those students going to be? You talk about customer loyalty. You catch them now when you're hurting at school. I know how I was, you know, with my five-star, five-dollar pizza and my Hungry Howie's and my ramen noodles, my smack ramen noodles budget on, on college. And, you know, to really be in a situation where I've got to think about, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen to me? The anxiety and the worry and how that... Uh, not be something that I've got to worry about from a big band like that. Talk about top of mind awareness. And once you get my stuff into your storage facility, how difficult is it really going to be for me to go get it out of there? So again, smart move, marketing, um, and again, creating stories, uh, innovative way to really think about listening to what's most important to your audience. Um, and then being creative, innovative, and taking action to look at ways that you can build that loyalty currently and then extend that beyond that time. So I tried to get through a lot so that we could have the best part, which is Q&A and, and really dig in to the things that, uh, that are there. Um, and I wanna invite you all to really go in, let out and create something, whether you are an individual, a brand or an agency, uh, MDM, myself have something for you. And if you guys are uh, BizHack uh, people, I put together a special for everyone here on BizHack where I'm offering a, uh, a strategy session. And if you're interested in that strategy session where we can implement the uh, principles and the strategic thinking to your current communication strategy, whether it's for your social media or otherwise, really looking at people, brand, technology, and how we sort of root yourself in things that will not change around your business and integrate those core principles into an effective digital marketing strategy beyond some of the top line things that we talked about here. Let me know. Please uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, email me. I know Dan is going to be sharing some information. Please feel free to reach out. I would love to speak to you and get into some more specifics as to how these general principles can be applied and leveraged for your own business. Whether you're an individual brand, whether you're a business, or whether you're an agency, we can speak about ways that you can leverage some of the principles I talked about today to deliver on brand growth and generating customer loyalty beyond the current time. Thank you, Abdul. And yeah, we'll be sending information, including this deck, um, and we will be posting this on our YouTube channel because I know a lot of people uh, want to hear you again. Uh, it's really something when you listen to someone and say, boy, I want to hear that again. Um, we're also uh, on Facebook Live right now. So if you go to our Facebook page, that will be archived there as well. Um, Serena made the point that Bacardi um, is also doing the hand sanitizer with their um, kind of alcohol leftovers. And we had a lot of really great ideas from earlier in the hour. Um, about ways in which you can uh, cement customer loyalty. I wanna just share a few of them. Um, Gustavo wrote, offering free content through social media and keeping in touch through email newsletters. I, I think that that's kind of like the, the, the one-two punch. You know, if you, if you are active on social media and talking to your tribe on email, you're doing, um, the, the, uh, that's, a, that's a really good foundation for everything you would wanna do. Um, Alexis takes a more personal approach, continuously communicating via phone calls and text messages, creating that personal relationship that goes beyond the business. And Kenneth um, uh, said something that I thought was really savvy. He said, giving them personal service by calling them when a specific tax and financial topic comes up that relates to them specifically. I really do think that if you say, I saw this and it made me think of you, and it's a text message or an email or a phone call, that is really powerful right now. Because I think a lot of us feel isolated and unsure of what we're doing. And when you know that somebody's out there thinking of you and cares about you and, and is trying to help you, that, that is a, a powerful thing. We uh, had some other great examples from Grace Villamayor and Jeff McClelland about how to be flexible and empathetic. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Abdul, this is a question that we got um, about listening. Um, and we're pretty short on time, so try to keep the answer short, but how can you leverage people, technology, and culture to listen? How would I leverage people, technology, and culture to listen? 
In other words, there are technologies that you can use to listen. You can listen to people. And then you have to listen with a cultural awareness mm -hmm. because, you know, what I bring to my listening is different than what you bring to your listening because of who I am. So I was wondering if, if you think about the kind of research and listening from that people culture technology lens. Yes, got it. So from a people standpoint, the first thing is, and, I, and again, I don't want to sound too basic, but people really complicate marketing, business, and life. And so I always root myself in the things that are always an absolute. And when you look at people, you, you look at people from the lens of the people who are in your organization. And if you're the leader of the organization, it starts with you, right? So it's first getting aligned with the people. And so the listening and the research starts with you going in. And then the brand has to reflect those core principles that the leader aligns on. And then what the leader does is it enrolls the people, again, sticking with that principle, that are going to be representing the brand and the people who the brand will be interacting with, the customers, the clients, the partners, et cetera. So that's the people lens that you look at, right? And again, everything is rooted in the listening, right? So go inside, listen. A lot of times people call that listening meditation. People call that listening going out for a walk in nature, whatever it may be for you. Listen, get your core principles uh, down, right? Like Nike listened and their core principle was something that was greater. My core principle is standing for humanity, period, regardless of what your race is or where you're from. That's who I am, regardless of whether I'm selling digital or whether I'm selling uh, empanadas, right? This is core principle of who I am, and that will always be reflected in my brand. So go in, that becomes the people. And then the people that work for you have to be people that vibrate and share that same frequency. Otherwise, when they're dealing with the other people, the people you're trying to get money from, then it's going to be a miss. And there's no authenticity and your brand will fall. This is why it starts with people and it starts with you going in and deciding who you are and what part of you is going to be reflected in that brand personification. You've got to humanize a brand because at the end of the day, again, this isn't complicated. We make it complicated, but people do business with people. People do business with people. So at the core, it, it, you can't complicate it. Go inside if you're the leader decide who you are and what part of you is going to be reflected in that brand personification, period. And then hire people, train people, and work with people that fit that description. And that's it. Once you do that, at its core, everything else you do from that point on fits under that umbrella. And so the people that you're going to be, attract from the communication that you put out are going to be the people that resonate and vibrate at your higher vibration, at, your, at what you're throwing down, period. People who don't like Abdul, it doesn't matter what I sell or what deal it's going to be. They're not going to buy from me, period. And I know that, and I don't care, right? Because it's, it's not, you you're not trying to sell to everybody, right? And so if you double down on that, which people are so scared to do, just be yourself and let the brand be you, and then enroll people who run the, it starts with people, and then the people become the brand. And then that way, if you enroll people who fit that same ethos, their communication, whether they're talking to their friend or whether they're typing it in an email or whether they're putting it on social media, reflects the brand. Do you get it? And then their loyalty is there, which means that the people they're talking to's loyalty is there. So that's what I mean when I say people first. You gotta listen inside, then let something out, and then you're creating what the brand will be. And then you're hiring the people to support that. You're enrolling them in that vision, in that ethos, in that core principle that stands beyond the product or service. This is the magic. It's beyond the product or service. That's why brands are going to individuals and why influencer marketing is a billion dollar industry now. Because people are going to the people to get them to rep the product. Because again, people do business with people. They don't care. You got, what's her name? And I, and I apologize for any Kardashian fans, but for me, it's just phenomenal from a marketing standpoint that this woman, this kid can, can just, and now all of a sudden it's, it's oh, she puts something out there and it sells through the roof. And it doesn't matter what the product is or what the service is, right? And so this is no mistake. We live in that world. And as brands, we're ignorant if we're ignoring that. Fundamentally build your business around that. The business is you, you are the people, the people are the people, the people attract the people, and that's what keeps things going, right? And then so then you move on to the brand. When you've got that, 
that becomes the core principles that the brand communicates everything from, everything from. And that allows you to create that brand. And a lot of times, once you have the principles, you got to get with the specialist or, or someone who is a masterful communicator. And I've worked with many of them. And some have shared that in certain areas, I am one. But you've got resources. Once you get that, that people done, get with someone if you don't know how to position that brand to reflect the core principles of the people. Once you do that and you build your brand around that, it doesn't matter what happens in the environment. It doesn't matter what product or service you sell, right? Because you've now focused on the things that do not change in business. And therefore, you can build your business around that. And all entrepreneurs at the core have to be the most flexible individuals possible because in all business, every day, there's something that comes up like uh, that you don't know how to deal with. And if you root yourself in the things that never change, when those things take place, it becomes very easy for you to adjust and pivot rather than having to go, oh my God, I got to recreate everything. I'm in crisis mode. No, everybody's cool because you've rooted yourselves in these things that do not change about business. And you've taken time to master them in a way that only your brand can do. Only your brand can do. You got a bunch of people out there selling burgers, but the difference is, is how that burger is done, this, that, and the other. It doesn't, and I use that as an example because it's like the burger places all over the place now, right? It's like people are doing it with, for a specific reason. How do you differentiate yourself within that? That becomes the brand. And then the technology, the technology comes into play because based on your people, right? And again, it goes back, people, brand, and the technology. Based on the people that you have, right? and the people that you're trying to serve, that is what's gonna tell you what technology you need to implement and integrate and at what velocity and technical level of expertise, period. And then it's not rocket science, it just, it's just, it's a formula. And so that's why we set up that framework for you to look at it and think in that way. And whoever asked a question for that specific example, if that wasn't enough, um, take me up on the offer for BizHack uh, webinar. Uh, members, and I can get into detail to more specifics once I get a, a little bit more insight as your specific use case. And then we can unpack the way you would look through those lens and create a specific strategy to, to serve that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Vanessa had a great question, as did Louis Brunicardi, but we don't have time. But I'll connect you both with Abdul uh, afterwards to address uh, that, those questions. I, I did want to honor uh, the time frame and, and you know, uh, Abdul, once you get going, you're like a, a speeding train, man. I love it. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, I just wanted to share with you guys that we have some offers that are coming out of the community uh, for free accounting and tax services, free search engine management services, and the Hospitality Heroes to distribute face masks. If you have anything that you uh, want to offer the community, let us know um, and uh, we will share it. Um, and we'll be sharing these offers uh, to uh, in the follow-up email. Um, we're also really excited. Uh, a lot of you here were, were here last week when Alex De Carvalho gave his talk about the business, uh, the, the digital marketing playbook for small businesses. Um, he's going to be leading a five-week accelerated course that starts in just two weeks from now. Um, I really would love uh, for you guys to attend that. Uh, to, you can apply at apply.bizhack.com. If you want to check out our syllabus, it's right there. And we have a lot more information on our website. So I hope you consider coming. It really kind of takes what we're talking about here at a high level, and it helps you put it into action with one-on-one -on -one and group coaching and a really structured curriculum. So uh, we're really proud of it. Uh, it's something we've offered for six years in person, and now we've transitioned uh, into online. Um, if you want to learn more about the, uh, to the five-week course, I'm going to be hosting a fireside chat, virtually, of course, uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., um, and you can uh, reserve a spot there, and I'll see you there. Our next speaker, again, is uh, Neto Almanza. He's going to be speaking about social media video ads, tips, and tricks. And then in two weeks, we're gonna do a session on building community with Shana Ostrovitz of the Accelerator 1909. Um, I'm really uh, so grateful to you, Abdul, for uh, doing this and for being here. Um, we are just so blessed 
uh, to have such amazing uh, community members willing to share their expertise and yes, their love uh, with us and with our community. So um, thank you very much, Abdul. And uh, I know there's a lot more to come. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're really excited to have you all here. Uh, thanks, Kenneth, uh, for that offer. Uh, it's great. Um, uh, and really appreciate everybody uh, taking their time out of a busy day and in a busy time uh, to learn a little bit with BizHack. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Abby. Nice to see you on the call. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, Hutch, really appreciate that. Grace, great to hear from you. Rosemary, one of our past featured guests. Ruth Ann. Sue Romanos, nice to see you, Sue. Vanessa uh, Comera, um, thank you all uh, so much. And, um, you know, Vanessa's question is probably one you can tackle while people are saying goodbye. She asked, how much communication is too much communication? Should there be a limit in how much we reach out to our audiences in a time where there's a lot of noise online? Yes, right. thank you, great question. Yes, there's a limit, and yes, you can annoy the heck out of people, especially right now. Um, and it's a great question, and there's no one magic answer because it depends on the community, right? And so certain communities um, and audiences, and based on your product service, and, and more importantly, what it is that you're communicating, are the things that you have to look at to determine what the sweet spot frequency would be. Um, you know, so that's something that, you know, perhaps if you give me a call, we can really speak to what your communication plan is. Um, oftentimes when there's a question about frequency, one of the things that's low lying fruit to look at is your overall mix, right? So if you are only on two platforms and you're pounding everybody with emails in these two platforms, one way that you can uh, message more is to diversify your messaging and diversify the, the number of platforms that you're communicating on. That allows you to keep a high level of frequency, but not fatigue individuals that may communicate or uh, consume the content that you're putting out in one way or another. I know, for example, emails, uh, for me, I get too much of them, so I tune those out, but I'd be open to getting it perhaps in an in a IG story real quick when I have the time to go through it and look at that. So you really have to, again, everything is rooted in listening to your current audience, understanding who those people are and those communities that you're trying to serve, and that's going to really indicate for you the platform and the technology and the frequency that you have to put in place in order to make them happy and to provide value. You know, Abdul, we know that you're, uh, everybody's hanging on your words because nobody's actually dropping off the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, we, we, um, we will be back here in one week, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you again, Abdul. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around for that little bonus uh, Q&A, and we'll see you in a week. Take care. Thank you, Dan. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Love you guys. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Take care. Stay safe.